Hi guys, it's me Kazar HD and welcome to my third podcast episode reviewing the Hungarian Grand Prix of 2024 and it was a race that wasn't that exciting in terms of overtaking. I mean, we got some, but not a lot. Um, but towards the end of the race, of course, the drama did increase quite a bit, even if there was no actual overtaking, proper overtaking being done. Um, but yeah, it was um, an interesting, let's say, Hungarian Grand Prix. Even if, again, there wasn't a lot of racing going on for a lot of the event itself. But obviously, I'll flash up the results on screen. Oscar Piastri got his first Formula One win in Hungary. Congratulations to him. He was the best driver during uh, the Hungarian Grand Prix. Fully deserved. And of course, we'll get into all of that drama in a moment. Uh, and then obviously, Lando Norris finishing second. First McLaren 1-2 in Hungary in a very long time and also first McLaren 1-2 I think since 2021 so yeah good for McLaren and then you had Lewis Hamilton in third uh, Charles Leclerc fourth Max Verstappen fifth and then so on and so forth for the rest of the top 10 and in this episode we will go through not everyone who finished in the top 10 but most of everyone but of course there is only one place we can start with this Hungarian Grand Prix review, and that is talking about the drama at McLaren. So, before we get to that, let's just quickly get into how it ended up um, being the way it was towards the end of the race. So, at the start, obviously McLaren locked out the front row. Lando Norris had a good start, but not as good as his teammate, Oscar Piastri, who was right alongside him down the pit straight. Lando did squeeze him slightly, towards the pit wall, but thankfully didn't go any further. And then Oscar carried himself down the inside of Norris, and Verstappen, of course, was trying to go around the outside of the pair of them. He ended up going off the track. We'll get into his crazy race later on. Um, and Piastri then got into the lead. And I was thinking after he got into the lead, and once Norris was let through by Verstappen for second, that maybe over the course of the race, Lando would just slowly but surely get his way to the back um, of Piastri. But until that final, um, say, what, uh, 30 laps, Oscar was fully in control of the Grand Prix. He was comfortably leading, managing the tyres very well, and was looking just absolutely brilliant. And then, a few laps before he made his final pit stop, made a mistake, lost a couple seconds that allowed Lando Norris to get a bit closer to him and put some pressure on. But then Oscar started be right before we got to that final pit stop to pull away and put the gap um, you know, back up to about a couple seconds. And then McLaren, who were focused on covering off Lewis Hamilton, who had pitted for the second and final time, decided to pit Lando Norris, the second car, first before Oscar Piastri. And then pitted Piastri, the lead car, second which was a stupid decision, and not only was that stupid, but leaving Piastri out not just one lap later, but two laps later. It just doesn't make sense to me. Um, and then, yeah, Piastri came out after his pit stop about three, three and a half seconds behind Norris. Eventually, the gap did go up to five, uh, what was it, five or even six seconds between Norris and Piastri, with Lando Norris uh, then leading. McLaren repeatedly were telling Piastri it's okay you'll still be let through by Lando and on the other end with Lando he was being begged by his engineer and team please let Oscar through and let him win the Grand Prix and thankfully for the team relations he did with a couple laps to go let Oscar back through and Oscar Piastri ended up winning the Grand Prix but it really took the, all of the shine from um, Oscar's first win because you couldn't really, if you were an Oscar Piastri supporter, you couldn't really enjoy it because of the drama. And this drama is all McLaren's fault. They had absolutely no reason to do what they did. Piastri was leading, Norris was in second, there was a two-second lead uh, that Piastri had to Norris. Lewis Hamilton, who had made his final pit stop, was about... 25, 26 seconds behind Lando Norris, who was the second car for McLaren. You need about 20, 21 seconds to make a pit stop and come out, you know, still in front of the car that you are racing. So Lando had a comfortable gap 
So if Piastri, if they, you know, if they had pitted Piastri first, which is what they should have done, and then pitted Lando second, the result would have been the same. Piastri would have been in the lead, Norris would have been second. But for some reason, they decided they had to pit Lando first, and I still don't get again why they left Oscar out for two laps and, you know, didn't pit him straight away a lap after. I just don't understand that. But, yeah, just a completely stupid decision by McLaren, creating unnecessary drama, ruining the, you know, what should be brilliant celebrations for them. A 1-2 finish in Hungary. Not only a 1-2 finish, but a 1-2 finish that they've earned on pure pace. They didn't have to rely on others crashing or anything like that. They deserved thoroughly to get the 1-2 finish. They were clearly the best team during the weekend, had the best car. And like I said, with that decision, they completely took the shine off of, you know, Oscar's first win and the result itself. Um, So, so stupid from McLaren. And what it does show is their lack of experience at racing at the front. Because, of course, McLaren only in the last year have been racing regularly at the front of the Formula 1 grid. From, say, you know, midway from last year back to 2013, they were a midfield team almost all the time. So this pressure on them to get strategy right and to not play stupid games like this was not as high as it is now. So I'm hoping, really hoping, they learn a lesson from what happened at the Hungarian Grand Prix. Because you can't be doing that in the future. Because next time, if they do do that, Lando Norris might not be so kind. And I mean, Lando made his point over the radio that, you know, he believes the championship's still on um, and believed that, you know, he... Uh, should have gone after uh, the race win and got the points, given that Max Verstappen ended up finishing down in P5. So I really hope they don't try this again. And if you remember, they actually did this with um, with Lando and Oscar last year at the same Grand Prix in, I think, the second round of pit stops, funnily enough, where Piastri was ahead of Norris, and then even though Piastri was the lead McLaren... McLaren pitted Lando first and in the end it was you know it worked out and it was okay because Oscar had no pace towards the end of last year's Hungarian Grand Prix because he was really struggling to manage his tyres and Lando ended up finishing second so you know it was fine back then but yeah it just doesn't make any sense why they did what they did the lead car as we know within a team the lead car gets the preferential treatment and as we saw during the race The undercut was better than the overcut because even if you went longer on your tyres, as we saw with Max Verstappen, having fresh tyres was great when you were in clean air, but it's very hard still to overtake at the Hungaro ring even with fresher tyres. So, yeah, just absolute stupidity from McLaren. But, you know, great result. 1-2 for the team. Very happy for Oscar, even though, again, the shine was took off for him. Um, He... um, I, I, do, I do feel sorry for him. Obviously, he was uh, even apologetic on the radio, which he shouldn't have to be um, after winning his first Grand Prix. And he didn't even sound that happy. And again, because of how things happened, it was just a very weird end to the race and just completely ruined his moment. It really, really did. But yeah, great job by Oscar. Been in really great form as of late. And I did say in my qualifying watch along for the Hungarian Grand Prix that... That race win, that first race win for Oscar was very soon around the corner, given that in Austria he was very close to it and thankfully got it in Hungary. And yeah, we'll see how Oscar progresses now that he's got that race win, uh, first race win, and maybe we'll um, start to take it to Lando in the championship. We'll see how that goes. But I mean, overall for McLaren, despite the drama... The result was great for them. Um, in the Constructors' Championship, they've gained uh, quite a lot of points on Red Bull. Nearly 30 points have been gained on Red Bull. So, yeah, on the constructor side, McLaren looking very good. And McLaren up to second in the Championship as well. So, McLaren's aim of winning the Constructors' Championship looking good. 
And for Lando Norris, even though he finished in second, um, you know, he still gained a few points on Max. So, still keeps those hopes alive, even though he finished in second. But, I mean, realistically, we know he's not going to win the championship because he can't beat Max regularly enough, I don't think, to, to win the championship. Even though McLaren, at the minute, seem to have the faster car around, say, most track configurations. But, yeah. Great result for McLaren. Um, and then, yeah, after that, obviously, Lewis Hamilton ended up finishing third. Great race from Hamilton. A great start to the race. And, uh, yeah, just had a, a great race, really. Uh, kept nice and close to Max Verstappen in the first stint. Then went for the undercut. And that undercut is why he got the podium. I mean, obviously, Max Verstappen's collision with him uh, and Max going off the track and losing time definitely helped as well. But the undercut that Mercedes went for, which they had to go for if they were to get the podium is really why they got the podium, because they were nice and aggressive. Lewis had the pace to pull it off, and he absolutely did. Great drive by Lewis Hamilton on the podium, second race in a row. Um, but in terms of the uh, crash between Hamilton and Max, the stewards um, saw no reason to give a penalty to Verstappen or Hamilton for the collision. And to be honest... Looking at the collision, I mean, maybe, yeah, you could argue Max deserved a penalty. I think Max was more at fault for the collision because he just braked too deep um, and, you know, uh, went too deep into the corner. But at the end of the day, I mean, Max, he already lost a load of time and a couple of positions anyway from the accident. So I don't think it's too bad that, um, you know, no uh, penalty was given. But it was quite surprising that they collided when they did because, I mean, they'd been racing wheel to wheel for quite a lot of the race and then suddenly into turn one Max goes deep Lewis began to turn into turn one and then yeah as Max was then coming across to the left contact was made I think you know if you were to say it was a racing incident I think that's probably a fair uh, conclusion as to what happened there um, but I do have to talk about Max Verstappen and Red Bull because Max was very hot let's say over the radio uh was uh you know complaining a lot and i know people you know um have come out after the race and said yeah max you know was uh bitching a little too much and was probably complaining too much and maybe being childish even his own engineer i think said that towards the end of the race and maybe yeah he was a little over the top in how much he was complaining but i think he has a a, a really um a lot of good reason, let's say, to be complaining as much as he is. And no, by the way, David Croft, it wasn't because he didn't get enough sleep because he was sim racing. How fucking annoying was that, uh, by the way, during the race? If you were listening, by the way, to the uh, Sky F1 commentary of uh, David Croft and Martin Brundle, David Croft repeatedly bringing it up. Oh, but he was sim racing at 3 a.m. Who gives a fuck? Wasn't the race he won a few weeks ago where he did a 24-hour sim race and then he uh, a few hours later won the race? Wasn't it Imola, I think, or something like that? So, yeah, uh, who cares? Honestly, who cares? Um, but, like I said, Max has a lot of good reason to complain. He does. Because, at the end of the day, the Red Bull car he's been driving has not got any better since the start of the season. It's... In fact, judging by Max's complaints, it's only got worse. The balance of the car is not as good as it was. It's got a lot more understeer than it, um, you know, than it had before. And Max does not like understeer. He does like a very pointy car, and you know, having understeer is not good for that. And I mean, we saw it at times with his onboard during the race. The car understeering a lot through um, turn one, the final corner as well. And that is going to cost you a lot of lap time if you're understeering as much as that. Um, so I think had a it has a lot of good reason, like I said, to complain. Because Red Bull are not performing well right now. Um, you know, at Silverstone, obviously Max had a trip through the gravel in qualifying, which damaged his car. Cost him a chance of getting pole. But then in the race, Red Bull didn't have any good pace until the end. And Max did pretty well to finish in second. And then here in Hungary... Red Bull simply weren't on the same pace as McLaren and then in the race ended up finishing in fifth and 
you'd have to say in hindsight, Max was right as well when it came to the strategy. Uh, Max going a few laps longer into the race was not the right decision because even though he had fresher tyres for the latter parts of the stints and the race, he couldn't overtake because, again, of how hard it is to overtake at the Hungaro ring, which is why the undercut is king at the Hungaro ring. Um, so... I think Max is, again, he's really in the right with his complaints. Maybe, again, he did go a bit over the top at times, but what he's saying is absolutely true. Red Bull are not performing well right now, and they've got to step their game up, because if they don't, they won't win the Constructors' Championship. And you never know if Max, you know, continues to lose out to McLaren, mostly because of Red Bull's failings with their car. Maybe Max won't win the Drivers' Championship. Maybe Lando Norris can with the Drivers' Championship. If McLaren keep improving as they are, Red Bull don't get any better, as they have been throughout the year, it's possible. So I think Max has every right to complain. So, yeah, um, a dramatic race from Max Verstappen's side. And maybe these are the clear signs that Max Verstappen and Red Bull as a partnership is coming to an end. Of course, those rumours still going on that Max might be off to Mercedes next year, but... We'll have to see what happens on that front. But I think if you're a Red Bull and Verstappen fan, I think, you know, don't get too uh, down, let's say, on what happened um, at the Hungarian Grand Prix weekend. Because for this weekend's Grand Prix at the uh, Spa-Francorchamps circuit, obviously with the Belgian Grand Prix, it should be a better circuit for Red Bull. Because, of course, it's a power track, Red Bull a lot better at power tracks than McLaren are, which will give Red Bull an important edge over McLaren. And I think Max will be in better form than he was in Hungary. So I don't think, uh, if you're a Red Bull fan or a Max fan, I don't think you should worry too much at the moment. Um, and also talking about Red Bull, of course, I've got to talk about Sergio Perez. I know there are um, possibly a viewer question or two about Sergio Perez, which I will get on to later on. But yeah, Sergio Perez, another awful weekend. Uh, the crash he had in qualifying was pathetic. No reason to push as hard as he did into turn eight, where he ended up in the barriers. And then in the race, never really had any pace and ended up finishing in P7 only really because of the performance of the car, more so than anything he did. Um, I, th I do think at this point, if I was a, a betting man, I would probably bet that Sergio Perez will not be in the Red Bull car um, where we come back from the summer break at Zandvoort in a month from now. I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case because, you know, people keep saying, and even Christian Horner, the Red Bull team boss, keeps saying, you know, Perez, he needs to step it up. And we've seen the last couple weekends in qualifying, he's had two very preventable crashes. And it just feels like it's heading the same way it did with Alex Albon at Red Bull and Pierre Gasly. And at this point, it feels like um, Perez is too far gone at Red Bull, so yeah. Um, also, out the front runners. Uh, finally, before we move on to some other topics, do you want to shout out Ferrari? I thought they were a very, um, very, very good performance um, from the Ferrari team in the race. Uh, their race pace was much better than expected. Was helped at times by going for the overcut. Therefore, in the latter parts of the race, they did have a lot better pace and that allowed them to be, you know, in that fight for the podium. But even in the first stint, Leclerc was only, what, a second and a half behind Hamilton, who was only then a second behind Max Verstappen. So, yeah, very encouraging pace from Ferrari. I don't know if that was just a one-off or maybe, because I do know they brought a, a new upgrade in Hungary, a small upgrade. Maybe they've... Uh, um, improve the car somewhat we'll have to see going into spa whether that does continue but i was very encouraged by what i saw they were you know actually in the fight with the other teams which is not what we saw really at silverstone um and even if you look back at the spanish grand prix in barcelona a few weeks ago they were never really in the fight with mercedes red bull um and mclaren but in this race they were, and very good performance, by the way, from Charles Leclerc. Probably his best performance since his Monaco win. So, yeah, encouraging from them. 
Spa should be a better track for them than the Hungaro ring. Obviously with the very high speed uh, Sector 1 and Sector 3. So we'll see how they go uh, this weekend. But yeah, we'll uh, we'll see whether they can keep up this uh, slightly better race pace that we did see. Um, the only other thing I want to go through from the race is uh, Aston Martin. And I just want to quickly touch on them because... Fernando Alonso in the race on the radio sounded just completely fed up, as Martin Brundle said on commentary. And it was because um, Aston Martin, once again, you know, I, I showed in my qualifying build-up on my qualifying stream, you know, they brought a load of new upgrades. Pretty big upgrade package, and it didn't really work. Um, the two, uh, What was it? Uh, Lance Stroll and the Aston Martin, who I think was the highest finishing Aston Martin, Finished 1 minute and 17 seconds off the lead, off the race winner, which is nearly a lap. Um, yeah, that's clearly not an improvement, is it? Considering in qualifying, they locked out the fourth row of the grid and were 8 tenths of a second away from pole. Decent performance, but in the race, yeah, their performance was just horrendous. And I know people may say, well, they pitted too early, but even with the undercut compared to the other midfield teams, their pace wasn't that good. And I think that's really why Alonso was so miserable, because he knew the pace of the car just wasn't good, really, at, at any time. Um, and, yeah, they only ended up with um, a single point, I believe, from the Hungarian Grand Prix. And are still in big trouble with their car moving forward. And talking of Aston Martin, that leads, to, uh, leads us on now to... Some viewer questions, um, which I'll now get into. I asked you guys for this on my community post that I posted a few days ago. By the way, if you want your uh, F1-related question answered for the next recording, which of course will be the day after the Belgian Grand Prix, make sure to post it in the comments of this video, and then I will... Uh, answer it in the following recording like I said the day after the Belgian Grand Prix but I want to start with an Aston Martin related question from G Walker who asks what is the plan for Aston Martin after falling from grace as I guess upgrades have failed short term I think they're just trying to learn as much as they can about where they've gone wrong for this year uh, to try and help them next year but long term it's very clear that they are desperate to get Adrian Newey in as their uh, chief designer. But at this point, given how bad they have proved to be in the last year and a half at upgrading the car, and there must clearly be some correlation issues from you know the wind tunnel to the track, I'm not sure Adrian Newey is going to make much of a difference because even if he comes up with some great ideas, will we actually see that translated onto the circuit? That's been the issue with Aston Martin. Fundamentally, I think they've got a good car. I mean, we saw at the start of the year, they were probably just about part of that front-running pack. I mean, Alonso had a couple of races where he was fighting with Mercedes and, you know, uh, Ferrari to an extent. And now, you know, half a season in, they're struggling to score a point and they're almost a lap down on the race leader by the end. And the race leader is not Red Bull, who, you know, was at the start of the season. Now it's McLaren. So, yeah. Um, it appears that their plan is to try and get Adrian Newey in. But I think they've got much bigger issues than, you know, who their chief designer is. Because, again, fundamentally, the car is good. They just can't improve it for some reason. But let's get into these other questions. Uh, Miss Marquise uh, asking, Ferrari are pretty optimistic about the new floor. Do you think McLaren will make a jump past them and finish ahead in the constructors? Of course, that was asked before the Hungarian Grand Prix. Um, I mean, Ferrari, maybe with this new floor, as we saw in the race, maybe it's given them an extra tenth or two per lap, which is great. But as was proven in the race and has been proven in the last few weeks, McLaren have a much faster car than Ferrari, and I don't think that is going to change for the rest of the season. I think McLaren, unless Red Bull really seriously improve, or Mercedes, you know, a, a bolt and upgrade on that really moves them uh, a lot further forward in terms of pace, 
McLaren probably will have the best car moving forward for the rest of the season at most tracks. So I think with Ferrari, I think third in the championship has to be their aim at this point because I think even they know McLaren are just too quick for them. And McLaren at this point, I mean, they're fighting for every single race win right now. Ferrari have not been fighting for a race win since Monaco, which was, you know, a few races ago. So, yeah, I think McLaren, I think they've got the better of the Scuderia. Uh, KH asking, what do you think about Perez's future with Red Bull? Will Sonoda have a chance for Perez's seat? I think if Sonoda can, can get a top team ride, he will do very well. As I explained in my stream a couple of days ago, yeah, Sonoda is not Red Bull's guy. Um, he's more of Honda's guy. And that's why there are rumours that maybe he'll go to Aston Martin in a couple of years. Yeah, Red Bull, they just don't want to put him in the car because, you know, the only reason really they put Sonoda in the Alpha Tauri back in the day was because of Honda, not because I think Red Bull necessarily wanted him in that car. So, um, yeah, I, yeah, even though Sonoda would do a good job, had a, a another very good race in Hungary, they clearly don't want him to be in that car. If they did, then I think he would already have been in that car already uh, but Sergio Perez I think at this point I think he will be dropped and I think he will be dropped probably for Daniel Ricciardo and then you'll see Liam Lawson partner Yuki Tsunoda and we'll see if Perez can somehow keep um, a spot on the grid for next year uh Laurie Rostogi asking do you think Red Bull should have signed sites for next year I strongly believe they should have done in terms of quality, I mean, yeah, Carlos Sainz is better than any of the other options being discussed, um, you know, to replace Perez. But as also I said on my stream a couple of days ago, um, back in the day, obviously, Max Verstappen and Carlos Sainz were teammates of Toro Rosso. And the dynamic between the two, not in terms of the drivers, but the, so the entourages and the families uh, wasn't great. And I think Red Bull keen to avoid that. So I don't think we're going to see Max Verstappen and Carlos Sainz be teammates. But if Max Verstappen does go to Mercedes, then I think very possibly, yes, we could see Carlos Sainz go to Red Bull. Because, I mean, who would Red Bull be able to get in their car? I don't think they'd be able to go after Kimi Antonelli to put him in the Red Bull unless they paid up quite a lot to get him from um, Mercedes. So, yeah. And obviously, you know, a lot of the other top drivers are under contract. So, yeah. We'll see how it goes. But most likely, I don't think Carlos Sainz will be a Red Bull driver. Uh, Astro asking Danny Rick and how you rate him, what you think his best chance for the future is and his most likely fate here. Please, Chazza. Um, Ricardo. I have to say, in the race in Hungary, and he did actually say this after the race on the radio, that he was uh, screwed over with strategy because he, you know, was just pitted too early and then put into too much traffic, which is the issue if you do pit uh, quite early, is then you have to contend with a lot of traffic, which is what Ricardo had to do. Um, but still had a good race despite it, but that's why he ended up getting beaten by... Um, his teammate Yuki Sonoda. But I think Ricardo, you know, given the car he's driving compared to what Sergio Perez is driving, I think Ricardo's doing a better job. Therefore, I think Ricardo deserves the chance. Um, I mean, you know, preferably I would put Yuki Sonoda in the car because I think Sonoda is the better driver. But Sonoda, as I've said, it is not an option for Red Bull, so. I think Ricardo will get in the Red Bull, and if he does well enough in the second half of the season, then he definitely will be, um, uh, you know, in that car in 2025. And that might actually help with Red Bull keep Max Verstappen at the team, because we know he is very good f uh, friends with Ricardo, and he's not had a teammate um, that he's liked anywhere near as much, um, you know, since then, since Ricardo left the team in 2018. So, yeah. I think Ricardo will be in the Red Bull, um, you know, at some point in 2024 and then maybe in 2025. Uh, Crystal Racing asking, is Lando Norris and Oscar Piastri world champion material? I think both are. 
I did make a video a couple years ago saying I think Lando Norris is world champion material, but I do think it will be more so dependent on the team slash car that he has, because I do think in a straight up fight with, say, Max Verstappen, Charles Leclerc, I do not favour Lando as much in a situation like that to actually win the championship, but you know, as it stands, McLaren have a faster car than anyone else, you'd have to say. And in that situation, I'd say Lando, yeah, I think can be world champion. But whether Lando, you know, next year, for example, whether McLaren can build him a car for next year that will be the best car on the grid for the whole season, we'll have to see. For Oscar Piastri, though, one thing we have seen since he came into Formula 1, especially as of late, which I think really could help him, in, say, a possible head-to-head -head championship battle with Lando Norris, if that ever happens in the future at McLaren, is I think Oscar is a lot more level-headed and a lot calmer than Lando. I mean, Lando, you know, he's pretty calm. He's not as fiery behind the wheel as maybe, say, Leclerc is. But I really do like how calm and assured and relaxed Oscar is uh, behind the wheel and that does give me a lot of hope that maybe in a championship situation he wouldn't get flustered and of course Piastri does have a you know experience of winning championships won the F2 championship uh, you know three years ago has had lots of success in uh, you know junior career so yeah I think both are definitely championship material but again it really does depend on the situation um, that they find themselves in in the future as to whether they actually will get the job done. And then the final uh, question is from Laurie Rostogi, another question from him, asking, what did you think of Alpine dropping Ocon? To be honest... I mean, I can understand it from the perspective of Ocon is not the best team player. I mean, that is true. I know Ocon maybe does get a bit too much blame for incidents with teammates because, you know, not every incident has been his fault. But there has been some where it has been his fault. And what he did in Monaco was unforgivably stupid. It really was. He could have cost the team dearly there in Monaco. And as we saw back, you know, in the Force India days, cost Force India probably a race win in Baku by slamming Perez into the wall. Um, and he's had, you know, uh, very, uh, he's had some near misses with teammates, remember with Alonso, I think in Hungary a couple years ago. So yeah, I, I don't think it's that bad of a decision. It all depends though on who they replace him with. If they can replace him with Carlos Sainz, then I think that's a great replacement because Carlos Sainz is a better driver than Esteban Ocon so really it depends on your replacement if you can replace a driver who is at a good level like Ocon and Ocon is still at a good level he's a good midfield driver if you can replace someone like Ocon with a driver at the same level if, if not better then great and again Carlos Sainz would be uh, an improvement on what they had and a Carlos Sainz Pierre Gasly driver lineup in the midfield is a very strong driver lineup. Probably, you could say the strongest driver lineup in the midfield if they do achieve that Alpine. Um, so yeah, I don't think that's a bad decision. We'll see, of course, where Ocon ends up. Probably gonna end up at the Haas F1 team. Hopefully, he does stay on the grid because even though he can be, um, again, not the best teammate, he is still easily good enough to be on the Formula One grid. But guys, thank you very much for coming along to this uh, podcast. It's been great to have you for this Hungarian Grand Prix review. And uh, let me just quickly update you guys as to what the plan is for next week. So, uh, or not next week, but later this week. I will be live on Friday night to do a qualifying preview for the Belgian Grand Prix. Saturday, I won't be doing a qualifying watch along, but I will be doing a race watch along on Sunday live at 12 p.m. UK time, two hours before the race begins to cover the final race before the summer break. Hopefully, I will have Nib with me as well. We'll see if he's able to join. Um, and then, a day after that, there'll be a podcast episode covering the Belgian Grand Prix. And then, probably a couple days after that, I will do a mid-season review for 2024. And that is something that 
I do want to hear from you guys for in terms of, you know, what you thought the season so far, who the best driver of the season has been, or who the top five best drivers have been. Of course, I'll go through my driver rankings and all of that stuff when, um, you know, we get to it. So, yeah, that is what is coming up on the channel in the next, what, 10 days or so, or the next two weeks at the very uh, latest. And, yeah, uh, I can't wait to bring you guys that content. But, guys... That is the Hungarian Grand Prix review and weekend done with until the Belgian Grand Prix weekend, the final F1 weekend before the summer break. And until my next piece of content, again, live on Friday night at 8pm UK time for my qualifying preview, it's been me, Chazer HD. Goodbye. <laughs>